he'd written down on, on a piece of paper and planned out in minute detail how he was going to reach the landmark of 100 wickets and 1,000 first-class runs in a county season. Tapes it in inside his cricket bag and worked out exactly where he was going to need to take his wickets and where he was going to score his runs. And he basically followed it almost to the letter and achieved that milestone with a game to spare, which I thought kind of summed up Hadley's uh, attention to detail. Cricket is a game that's steeped in tradition and one name that is always going to crop up when we talk about cricket and tradition is Wiston. From 1864 to 2020, it has been around and continues to be what it calls itself as the independent voice of cricket. And in 2017, it revived something that had a fairly successful run from 1979 to 2003 in a digital avatar. And since then, the Wisden Cricket Monthly has done an admirable job in bringing some of the finest written pieces on cricket to all the cricket lovers around the world. And that's exactly what makes me so excited to host Joe Harmon, who is the magazine editor of Vision Cricket Monthly, as we now have begun to call it. So a warm welcome, Joe. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Amit. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Uh, as I sit here, I see your name on a book in my shelf that says edited by Joe Harmon on the cover and has a foreword by David Lloyd. So can you guess which one I'm talking about? Oh, right. That would be... Uh cricketing all sorts from a couple of years back right great i have to tell you at this point that you know this book apart from being a wonderful one uh, it has been a real help to me when i uh, when i needed to make some cricket quizzes it is full of stories anecdotes and crazy amounts of trivia so so thank you for this one joe uh, it has helped me win quite a few quizzes and uh, prepare some as well uh, anyway at this point i'll throw a question to you okay to you know to warm things up more. So this is a quiz question. You need to identify someone. So this is an Australian cricketer who played four tests and three ODIs from 93 to 95. That's your clue number one. Can you identify him at this point? No, not, no. Not, All not, right. Yeah. Clue two is right arm bowler forced Desmond Hines to retire after hitting him in the face with a short ball on his test debut at the Waka. Domestic cricket giant with more than 400 wickets for Western Australia, but didn't play a lot for Australia. Just four tests. Uh, uh, Joe Angel? Oh, yes, that is Joe Angel indeed. J-O, the only Joe to play international cricket, not J-O-E, Joe Root of Joe. So, yeah, that is your namesake, Joe Angel. So, well done there. Uh, apologies for putting you through that. But, you know, I just wanted to turn up the temperature a bit on the, you know, warm welcome. But now I'll bring it down. Uh, so, Joe, before we get into what we do here, which is talking cricket photographs and nostalgia, I have a question that I would like to ask you. You were growing up watching cricket in the 90s and early 2000s. Just tell me, uh, how was that experience of following that English cricket team, the one before the Ashes 2005? Because I was, you know, one of the articles that has been written by you is your, you know, your favorite World Cup match, which you call the Kenya versus England affair from the 1999 World Cup. So I, I realized how it must have been for you as a 14-year-old watching that match and, you know, thinking that, okay, this is a World Cup at home, England can do well. And, you know, they won two out of two at that stage and then things began to fall apart. So, so just walk me through that, you know, that feeling of exasperation with that team. How was it growing up in England, following that team, which was, you know... It, it 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 had its characters but was not able to win too much and then the turnaround that has happened in the last few years well exasperation is is, is a good word certainly um painful would probably be another one I'd, I'd throw out there um certainly the 90s um up until about 2000 where england beat west indies under nasa hussein and then things started to turn around were pretty painful but the odd thing is when i look back on it it, it might it's perhaps not as painful as you might think because I'd never known an England team winning it. It wasn't like I, I couldn't really miss what I hadn't had previously. This was just what English cricket was to me. So you took the moments of glory where you could. Often they were individual moments rather than team moments because, as, as you alluded to, there weren't too many victories along the way, and certainly not against Australia in those, in those years. Uh, and then I suppose the 1999 World Cup was, 
there was a lot of um, optimism around that tournament that England, despite not having a great record, but in home conditions, they were a good one-day side uh, still. Um, and then, yeah, as you say, I was at that game at Canterbury for England's group match against Kenya. I think they'd already beaten Sri Lanka by that point. So they'd started well in that tournament. Um, and there was a bit of kind of, uh, yeah, optimism building that this side could perhaps go on and do something special. And then, to be honest, from, from there on, they stunk the place out. They were horrendous. They played one day cricket from the 1980s, batting really slowly um, and then got knocked out of their own tournament in the group stage uh, infamously before the uh, official song had even been released for the tournament exactly. England posts. Went what a disaster. Out, which, which was pretty bleak, to be honest. Um, and that 1999 World Cup was a real turning point for English cricket that whole summer because, as I know you remember, they lost to New Zealand at home in 1999 as well. Um, which sent England to the bottom of the test rankings, which was a real kind of wake-up call, I think. And the England, England, ECB brought in central contracts the following year, which meant the 14 or 15 contracted players were kind of owned by the ECB and could be looked after rather than essentially being owned by their counties and having ridiculous workloads and coming to play for England tired. They suddenly became primarily England players and the focus was on England rather than county cricket. And then we started to see the results over the next few years, building up to that famous 2005 Ashes series. And how does it feel from being that side in 1999, which probably must have broken your heart as a you know 14-year-old, to see this English side led by Morgan, which is pretty much you know the side to beat in this format in, in a matter of 20 years. How does it feel as an adult to you think, hey, it, it would have been so much fun if we had this kind of a side back when I was a kid? That's a good question, actually. I hadn't thought of it that way. It's it's hugely exciting to see uh, England winning matches, but also even more than that in some ways, the way that they play one day cricket, that that kind of Owen Morgan's revolution of playing fearless, bold cricket. Don't worry too much about the consequences as long as you're going through the process, which you know has worked for you in the past. And England are also blessed to have a phenomenal bunch of, of uh, batsmen uh, in, in all formats, really. Um, Test cricket is still a work in progress, I think. But there are signs there that, that England are starting to build something quite special with a, a good stock of fast bowlers. So I think English cricket is is in a good position. Um, the only thing I would say, looking at the, the next couple of months and the schedule next year, England have, I mean, they've packed so many games in. I, I do fear for them. Can they really do all the things they want to next year, given the fixture congestion and the fact that there's a T20 World Cup sandwiched between nine tests against India five against Australia, uh, I feel like something has to break at some stage. Great. Well, uh, before we move to the photo business, uh, for all the listeners out there, here is a special offer for you. You can get six issues of Wisdom Cricket Monthly for just £5.99. There is a link in the description of the video. You have to go to that link, click it, and well, you will follow it from there, I, I understand. But now moving on to the important bit, now moving to the photographs part. Tell me, I've uh, been really waiting for this because I believe you are someone as part of, you know, Wisdom Cricket Monthly. You have dealt with a lot of photographs. You've seen a lot of photographs. So I expect this to be a cracker of a list. So come on, Joe, let's begin this journey. Tell me the fifth on the list of five photographs that you're going to talk to us on this podcast. We call random cricket photos that make my guests happy. So my first selection is um, from my second ever day of live test cricket, um, which was at Lords during the 1993 Ashes. Uh, I'd been at Lords the previous summer to watch Pakistan beat England in a very exciting finish on, on, a, on day four, um, which was a real, even though England lost, was a really exhilarating introduction to, to test cricket. And I immediately fell for it. And my dad and I would go to Lords every summer for one day of cricket every summer um, up until I went to university probably. So it became a real part of the summer for me. And, and the second live day of Test cricket was, was that Ashes series. And we arrived on, on day four and England were getting absolutely pummeled. So Australia had scored 600 in their first innings. I think the top three had all got centuries and Mark Waugh had got 99. <laughs> so things were looking pretty bad. Then England were bowled out for about 200 uh, and asked to follow on. So when we arrived on day four, I think they were just beginning their follow on. So there was... The game was gone. There was only pride to play for. Um, and Mike Atherton, who became a bit of a hero of mine and, and summed up, uh, in some ways, England's struggles during that time, but he was, a, he was a kind of brave battler and the sort of player that England desperately needed. And he battered through pretty much the whole day. Um, 
very bravely against a very strong Australian attack. Um, he moves into the 90s as the day nears its end. And then what, he's on 97, tucks the ball into the leg side, uh, goes for two, is coming back for a third, and Mike Gatting sends him back, and Atherton slips. And some of your listeners might have already, I guess they'll be looking at this image now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's Atherton on all fours, and there's, there's quite a few photos of this, of this particular moment, but I've chosen this one because this is the one where you can actually see Atherton's eyes. You can see it's the moment of realisation. The despair where, in his eyes. The despair where he realises he's not going to get there and for a moment he's going to try and crawl his way to safety knowing full well that it's just not going to work. Um, and Ian Healy, Ian Healy takes off the bales and Atherton is, is run out for, for 99. Um, and... Uh, he never did get that Test 100 at Lords. He played on for what, another eight years after that, never managed it. 99 is highest Test score at the, the home of cricket. Um, <laughs> and that was a real early lesson in the pain of being an England fan in, in the 1990s. Because as I alluded to earlier, we, we had to seize on those moments of personal glory. And here was one ready to come that Atherton was about to get his 100 against Australia, kind of against all odds in, in the face of defeat. Uh, and then it was taken away at the, the very, very last. Uh, and Mike Gatting, who I blamed for that run out <laughs> as I was eight at the time. And I actually remember, remember my dad telling me to quiet him down because Mike Gatting plays at, at Middlesex at Lords, uh, And he was worried that some of the locals might get a bit annoyed by me uh, abusing Mike Gatting because he was 36 years of age at this time, not exactly in prime condition. And, and there was a run there. So I absolutely blamed Gatting. And to be honest, I've never, I've never really forgiven him for that <laughs> Well, he spoiled your uh, first day or was it the second day at cricket? Second day of cricket. And yeah, I've, I've, I've never particularly liked him since. Um, but in, <laughs> in a way, that, that, that 99 sort of summed up Atherton's in career, a kind of heroic in spite of defeat. Uh, there were those few moments of glory, famously at Johannesburg, where he, he batted out for a draw with Jack Russell. But Atherton was unfortunate to play in an era where, well, world cricket, in general, was very, very strong. Some brilliant bowling attacks at that time. And England rarely competed, certainly not against the best tennis teams. Very true. And it's, a, it's an incredible entry at number five. Uh, not so incredible if your name is Michael Atherton. You know, when it comes to Atherton, something about the man that I just don't really associate the act of smiling too much with him. At least not when he played for England. Now that he's on Sky commentary panel, that's a different thing. But... I don't know, it was possibly the back issue which was always there, added to the fact that he led an English team that hardly won anything. So yeah, in my head, Atherton and Jubilation don't just really go too well. Uh, but yeah, more than 100 tests with that pain and 50 tests as captain, I doff my hat to the man for perseverance. And the sad part is, of course, that more than 100 tests, but still not a century at Lord's. Yeah, he's not alone in that. I think Sachin never quite made it either, did he? Um, yeah, neither but... Sachin nor Ponting and I guess even Callis doesn't have. So, well, he's an elite company. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you're, you're right. I think there weren't that many smiles in Afton's career. I mean, there, there, weren't, there wasn't all that much to smile about at times. He was always fighting something, whether it was his back injury, as you say, or uh, the, the weaknesses of his own team or the brilliance of a new ball attack, whether that was Ambrose or Walsh or McGrath or Pollock, there were so many good fast bowlers around at that time. And, and um, he did admirably, admirably in, uh, in testing conditions. Indeed, indeed. What comes next in the list? What is entry number four? Well, actually, this is later in the same summer. And I should have said for the first one, again, it's by the same photographer, by David Munden, who coincidentally taken the first three photos that I chose. So he was obviously doing some fine work, um, a Getty photographer. Um, so this one, yeah, September 1993, this picture is, I'm just going to get up for myself here so I can remind myself. This is uh, Viv Richards, Sir Viv Richards, uh, in the changing room at the St. Lawrence Ground, Canterbury, Kent. Uh, Viv Richards has just played his last professional game of cricket for Glamorgan. Um, and this was an, this is an amazing game, actually. So this was... The final game of the Sunday League season. The Sunday League is the kind of domestic one-day league in England, or at least was at that time. Kent played Glamorgan, top two sides in the competition, and whoever won the game won the whole competition. And it came down to this do-or-die match at Canterbury. And Canterbury is, uh, I grew up just 10 minutes walk from, from the ground and have a very close connection to it. It's where I kind of first fell for the game. 
I was later a, a steward there actually uh, in my in my teens. I got wow. sacked for falling asleep uh, once, <laughs> so it wasn't all it wasn't all good memories. But um, there's a lot of history around Kent, the club of Colin Cowdery, Frank Woolley, Alan, and Knott. the tree, of course. The famous lime tree. I was going to mention that actually. So for your listeners who aren't aware of it, this is I think one of only two grounds in the world who first class grounds in the world which had a a tree inside the boundary rope, a famous old lime tree. Yeah. And the rule was that if the batsman hit the ball at the lime tree, wherever it hit the tree, it was four runs. So even if it hits the top branch, if it's sailing for six, that mm -hmm. is still four runs, which was kind of slightly controversial. I'm sure there must have been some controversial moments along the it way. It must have made for uh, some exciting moments on the field. Absolutely, it did. It did. And it was really, I mean, the ground there looks quite different now as a big supermarket and it's turned into something more modern. But it was such a lovely place to grow up watching cricket. And we were blessed with some unbelievable overseas players as well. We had Carl Hooper for several seasons, Aravinda de Silva for a year, later Raul Dravid and, and Steve Waugh as well. So we really were blessed in that sense. But I've gone here for a photo of an opposition player because, as I said, this was his last game of his career. And, um, I don't think I realised at the time as an eight-year-old that I was witnessing something special. Or, or I don't think I knew that much about River Richards' career, but obviously as the years went on, you realise that he's, I mean, perhaps the most iconic batsman in the history of, of the game. I mean, Sachin might have something to say about that, but he's, he, he's certainly <laughs> certainly up there. And, and the game just didn't disappoint. Um, Kent only scored 200, although in, in those days in a 40-over competition, that was a reasonable score. Uh, and then Viv comes in at number five, uh, he's roughed up by Duncan Spencer. I don't know if you've heard of Duncan yeah, Spencer. Yeah, the pacer who just, whose career went out after that glorious exactly. run-in with Viv Richards. There's a brilliant photo exactly. of Viv Richards actually giving a pat on the back to Duncan Spencer while, you know, after being roughed up by him. So, yeah, I would, I, that's a wonderful photo as well. Apparently, he said to Duncan Spencer afterwards, that's one of the face, fastest spells I've ever faced during this game because he yes. hit him a couple of times. Uh, and then he dismissed him but it was given as a no ball. But uh, Viv was heading off to the pavilion, having not even seen the umpire's call. <laughs> he's kind of called back uh, and then goes on to score. I haven't got the scorecard up there. I think he scored 40 odd not out to, to take the Morgan home, seal the, uh, seal the trophy in his final game. Uh, and I think at the time, as I remember, I think I was furious because I think I was, <laughs> I felt Kent had been cheated out of it because it shouldn't have been a no ball. And, Morgan had kind of had been lucky but now I look back on it with the benefit of hindsight I can see that I was very privileged to be there for the final uh, throws of, of just an incredible career and I love this photo in particular because Viv was such a kind of imperious strutting figure uh, never showed any vulnerability but in this photo he is a wreck basically I mean he's collapsed on the floor uh, he's exhausted and you can see the kind of sacrifice all the years that he's put into his career which perhaps wasn't always clear because he made it all look so easy uh, and it's just I think the photo kind of shows just how much he'd given to the game um, and we've still got those memories now. Yeah he looks tired you know it's like a well-deserved nap after a long long career but yeah the king makes the inevitable entry to the list although in a rather strange way you know because when we talk about Viv Richards and we, when we talk about his photographs Generally, it's about a photograph of him flaying the bowling attacks while chewing gum. But uh, yeah, this is a different one. Uh, you know, one thing that this photo reminds me is uh, I have these books of Adrian Murrell and Patrick Eger and they have these amazing photos from inside the dressing room. Players relaxing, having tea, having a smoke. And those photos gave so much insight into the characters of these teams, you know. Uh, now, of course, it has cricket has become more professional and... The entry has been restricted to photographers. But I feel the result is that we miss out on those um, charms of, you know, we, we don't get to know the players so well as we could through those photographs of them relaxing in the dressing room. So that's one of the things that struck me when I saw this photograph. Yeah, whereas this is this is raw and it's honest. And I, I'm sure you'll know the photo by Adrian Morel of, of both of them in the Headingley dressing room in 1981 yeah, after, exactly. his, after both. Um, that's another great example um i mean we we did a special in the magazine on the best of cricket photography uh four or five months back uh and we spoke to gareth gopley jones who's one of the, the kind of the best photographers around now and, and he picked that image as, as 
one which really inspired him. And it is a shame there are a few of those photos. There was what, there was a nice one in the England Australia dressing room at the end of last summer's ashes of all the players together. Um, yes, that was very sweet, actually. Yeah. Yeah, even that felt, it was a nice photo, but even that felt slightly manufactured, mm-hmm. and it? it wasn't just of the moment, it was everyone had gathered together. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it is a shame, and, and uh, I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of those old photographers, the names you mentioned, would have spent whole tours with England players and been very cosy. That was a real, the press pack and the players hung out a lot more then than they do now. So there was, they were more willing to let people into their lives in that sense. Yeah, and the game also turned more professional. I remember reading that Steve Waugh actually began this practice of not allowing anyone except for the cricketers into the Australian dressing room because we've seen so many brilliant photographs of, uh, you know, Australians celebrating their victories from the dressing rooms. But uh, once Steve Waugh became the captain, he said that, okay, only the cricketers deserve to be in this dressing room because this belongs to them. And, of course, it became a thing that, okay, photographers will not enter what is a sanctum sort of a place. So, well, moving on, next photograph, tell us which one it is. So this, as I said, this is another one by David Munden uh, and uh, returning to Lords, but four years later, this is uh, Ben Hollyoaks, England debut in an ODI against Australia. Um, ben Hollyoak was only 19 at the time uh, and was only playing his first full season for Surrey. And he'd been selected more for experience uh, in the squad. I don't think people anticipated that he'd play, but remarkably, England would tune up in the series with one to play. So with a dead rubber, I think they thought, let's throw him in, let's give him a chance. Um, before that squad was announced, actually, David Graveney, England's chairman of selectors, had called Adam Holyoke, Ben's older brother, who, who later went on to captain England's one-day side. And Graveney asked Holyoke, Adam Holyoke, do you think your brother's ready? And, and Adam Holyoke said to him, do you know what? No, I don't. I don't think there's enough form behind him. I don't think he's been through enough in the game to recover if things go wrong. Typically, uh, anyway, Graveney ignored, <laughs> Graveney ignored him and picked him anyway. And then we had this, this remarkable innings. Um, it's a special day for me as well. It's another game that I was there for, another day that I went to Lords with my dad. Um, we would leave Canterbury early in the morning and get there a couple of hours, or an hour or so before the start of play, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, in order to watch the players in the nets. And I remember we were watching Hollyoke batting in the nets and someone else called out to him, where are you batting, Ben? And he said, I'm batting number three, which which was a real surprise because he'd batted as low as number eight for Surrey that season. A uh, very un-English thing to do, throwing a 19-year-old at number three against Australia. Um, and even though there was a dead rubber, there was an element of risk to it because you don't want a youngster just to get out first ball and have his confidence destroyed. But... Honestly, the way he played, I mean, he got off the mark with it. I'd suggest to any of your listeners to go and watch this. There's a really good clip of it on YouTube of this, of this inning. It's just three minutes or so long. Um, he gets off the mark with just perfect straight drive off Glenn McGrath. It's another one through mid on. Then he's charging him and hitting him through the covers. And then later on in his innings, he, he slog sweeps Shane Warne for six. Um, and I spoke to Adam Hollyoak about this innings uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually. And he said... He said he had to start in, inside the dressing room. He couldn't watch. He was too nervous. But then after the first couple of shots and a few oohs and ahs from the crowd, he thought, right, well, he's not getting out for a duck. I can come out and enjoy this now. And he described that as one of the favourite days of his career, even though he, he wasn't the one performing that innings. Um, because it really, it was staggering confidence. And that's why I love this photo in particular, because you can see the way he's kind of pirouetting. He's up on his toes, almost like a kind of ballerina. And it just shows just how confident he was. There's an almost, there's kind of an arrogance to it in, in the best sense of the word. And um, he ended up scoring 63 off 48 balls, which, you know, these days wouldn't sound like much more than a cameo, uh, the way cricket's gone. But at that time, it was pretty extraordinary. Um, and then his Ben Hollyoak summer continued that me and my dad were back at Lords a couple of months later because um, Ben Hollyoak was playing for Surrey against Kent in the Benson and Hedges Cup semi-final. And he... Scored 98, uh, man of the match again, won Surrey that trophy. Uh, and later that summer, uh, he and Adam Hollyoak made their test debuts together. I think the only brothers to make their test debuts together in test cricket, I think, certainly of the 20th century, um, during the Ashes. So it was, a, it was a real breakthrough summer for a stunningly exciting all-round cricketer. He, he was a good bowler as well. Um, so this was... 
as ever in English cricket at that time, it was, is he the next Ian Botham? And that was the, that was the word on the, on the street at the time. Is he the one that's going to live up to that reputation? Um, and obviously, um, obviously he wasn't. I mean, he, he was tragically killed in 2002 when his car crashed into a wall in, in Perth near where he'd, he'd grown up. Um, he was only 24 at the time of his death. I think the youngest test cricketer um, to have died. And it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, such a tragedy. And he had found, he'd found a few years after that debut knock a bit tricky. He'd gone back to county cricket and hadn't done so well. But there were signs that he was starting to come good in his promise. And he was still so young. There was so much time for him to do so. Um, and speaking at Ben's funeral, Alex Stewart describes described him as the most naturally gifted cricketer he ever played with, which given some of the names that Alex Stewart played with over the year kind of says it all really. Yeah, exactly. You know, with as you said about the confidence part, I have seen the footage of the match and I must say, I don't think any England cricketer in more than 20 years that I've followed he has looked as confident as he did on debut. I don't know where did he gather that confidence from. Probably it was like nothing was at stake. So he just went at it beating the likes of uh, Shane Warne, Jason Gillespie, Megra to all parts of the ground. But yeah, this, this it was an incredible innings to see. You know, just a teenager making his debut against Australia and doing so well. And yeah, always this bit of, you know, what if that will remain associated with Tholyok, like there is to, you know, Corley Smith or even Phil Hughes for that matter. Also, uh, one more thing for those listening to this podcast david mandan as as he as joe has already talked of you know the first three photographs have been in fact by the photographer there is a certain story to him as well he moved from playing cricket to photography and did that quite well as we can see but before the age of 50 parkinson struck and he had to give a photography and in 2018 at the age of 60 he passed away so even that story, you know, I don't know how do the two converge here, but Ben Holyoke, someone so brilliant and confident at such an early age, passing away in a tragic accident. And then even the photographer who has clicked this photograph, having that sort of a angle to his story. I didn't know that. I mean, thank, I mean that's um, incredibly poignant. I didn't know he had, um, I didn't know much about David Munden as a, as a character at all. Um, yeah, he was a leg spinner and uh, then he gave up cricket to start with photography he was clicking photographs for i guess a good one and a half decade but then parkinson's happened and he had to give a photography before even he turned 50 and then at the age of 60 after a long battle he passed away in 2018 moving on to the next picture tell me which one is this so this is going a bit closer to to your home amit this is and we're fast forwarding a few years here this is uh, 2008 i'm sure all indian fans will immediately recognize this photo, or at least this moment, this is Sachin being hoisted up by Yuvraj Singh at uh, Chennai in, in 2008 after India have chased down through what is the 383, 387 um, to uh, beat England in the first test. Uh, I think it was the fourth highest successful chase in test history at that point. And there was so much around the game for, I mean, for, for India, obviously. Uh, and um, for me personally, I and mean, this was my first overseas tour as a, as a journalist. I was just writing for my own blog at this time, but doing work experience for All Out Cricket. So I, I'd got a commission to do a couple of pieces for All Out Cricket, who I worked for before Wisdom Cricket Monthly. They'd sorted me out accreditation. So this was an incredibly exciting trip for me, really, the kind of the first steps in, in proper cricket journalism. Uh, and then a few days before I was due to fly out, obviously there was the horrendous Mumbai terror attacks um, where I think 166 people were killed and um, at that point it wasn't clear whether the, the tour would take place. I think England left India, I think they cut short their one day series and left India to go to the UAE possibly um, where whilst they were still deciding whether it was safe to continue with the test series. Um, so actually as I flew out to India, England were flying sort of in the opposite direction leaving the country and I so it wasn't really clear if I was going to watch cricket or whether there wouldn't be any cricket to watch um I'll be honest at the time I was I was I was still pretty young and my first tour and given the context of what had happened I was a bit nervous about traveling but I, I, I still wanted to I still wanted to go um and I arrived in in Mumbai because that's I think where the first test was due to be taking place so that's where my flight was uh, and I was just amazed I mean the the city was was buzzing still and I mean there was obviously a sadness to it as well but there was absolutely a 
a clear desire to kind of continue. And I was actually, I was in Calabar where the attacks took place and I went to visit Leopold's cafe and chatted to a, a few of the locals about the attacks and about cricket in general. Um, and I got a real, it was interesting reading some of the column, English columnists talking about how disrespectful it was for, to suggest that the test series should continue given the, the number of people who died and out of respect for their families. But actually being in India and chatting to people, I realised that they'd completely got the wrong end of the stick. And for the vast majority of Indians, they wanted that series to take place. And there was a kind of a cathartic need for it in some ways that cricket needed to, to continue. Um, at least that was how I, I saw it. I don't, what are your memories of, of, of that time, Amit? Yeah, well, as as you said, that it was that sort of a time when the whole country needed something to cheer for. And I mean, you know, there have been so many people who criticize Sachin for not rising up to the occasions because they would say, hey, but he failed in this World Cup final on, or in this knockout match. But this was the occasion. What what more could you ask from a man? You know, this is a country that needs something to feel happy about. And there is this brilliant chase that he pulls off with Yuvraj Singh. Of course, before Sachin and Yuvraj joined together, it was Virender Sehwag who actually laid the foundation for that innings. But yeah, I, I would say it is one of the better knocks by Sachin in, in context of what happened. A lot of people talk about Sachin the cricketer and how determined he used to be as a cricketer. But I feel this is about Sachin the Indian and how determined he was to put a smile on the faces of a billion people. And, you know, he did that and he did that in an emphatic fashion. Beyond the context also, this was a cracker of a match between India and England. 387 is never an easy thing to ta uh, to chase on the fifth day. And Graham Swan was uh, operating, I guess, even Monty Panisa was there, if I'm not wrong. So these were these are quality bowlers. So It was, it was so much in the game. Andrew Strauss hit 200s. I think the first Englishman to hit 200s in a test match in India... It was Graham Swan's debut. He took two wickets in his first over in Test cricket. I think only the second player in history to do that. Yes. And as you mentioned, the Sewag knock uh, was just extraordinary. 83 off 68 balls. I think I'm right in saying he actually got man of the match. Uh, yeah, he did. He did. Which is, which is in some ways a bit odd when it's obviously so much Sachin's match. But I think also it was right because without that innings late on day four, the chase would not have even been remotely possible. Had it not been for Sewag, you know, most teams would have gone for a draw. But it was it was the kind of blinder that he played. And of course, that sort of a knock lifts the spirits up in the dressing room as well. And that's what we saw after that. Every batsman who came, they looked positive from the beginning because so much of that pressure had been taken away by that knock. So, so yeah, if, he made the life easier for the likes of Sachin and Yuvraj. But at the end of the day, taking on the likes of Panesar and Swan on, on a Chennai pitch on the fifth day is not an easy task. So, yeah, it was an incredible match, even if you remove the context. But yeah, in the light of the context, it's, 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 it's amazing, amazing cricket. Also about uh, Kevin Peterson. Not a lot of people see him as a remarkable English captain for a lot of things. But this act of leadership, I think it will shine on his resume. You know, the way he waded through this situation, that was something that was quite incredible of him. But uh, as, as, as you were here, as you were back here in India, how was the sentiment? Did you fear something? Did you, did, were there tensions? Uh, for, what, for me personally? Yep. No, I mean, I was certainly nervous before I got there, but as soon as I arrived in India, I was so glad that I'd come and, and, it, and it felt like it felt, cricket has never felt more important um, in any context. Uh, and it was clear that the game, if it was deemed safe to do so, needed to happen. And Kevin Peterson, as you, as you say, was really important in, in making that happen from the English perspective. A lot of England's players weren't especially keen. There were also suggestions amongst some of the England's set up that Kevin Peterson was so keen to play this test series because he had his IPL uh, future to, to protect um, and was, was interested in that in a way that other English players weren't at that stage. I think that's an unfair way of looking at it. I think there was much more at stake. I think Kevin Peterson, for all his faults, um, does care passionately about cricket and about test cricket uh, and saw the need for it to, to take place. And we were... Yeah, very privileged to have such a fantastic game as a result. The second game at Mahali was, was much less of a spectacle. Not that at all. Was, it uh, was quite a dust pretty, fest. Pretty drab stuff. Yeah, that was pretty pragmatic from, um, from Dravid. Um, the series was only a test, two test series because of the delay. So they only needed a draw. But I do just back to Chennai. I remember I was in the press box. That was my first 
overseas press box and I was sat next to Angus Fraser, the former England seamer who was writing for The Independent at that point, uh, the independent newspaper over in England. Um, he's a lovely man, but he's not the most enthusiastic. <laughs> he's got the, the reputation of being a bit of a, a grumpy bugger, to be honest. But um, he said to me as Sachin came off, he, he just said, this is one of those genuinely special moments. So to hear someone like Gus Razor say that, who's experienced so much as a player and as a journalist and someone who's not prone to giving out praise, um, that really hit home just what a special thing I'd witnessed and coincidentally in my, in my first test overseas. Great, beautiful experience that. First tour you, that you covered was such a crucial, such a tense one. And well, all is well that ends well. So I'm, I'm sure you must have learned a lot. And putting you in the dock for one last time, tell me which photo would you put on the top of the list? It's, this is a little bit different in that it's the only one that I wasn't actually there for. Um, in fact, it was taken a year before I was even born in 1984. But this is uh, Richard Hadley, the great New Zealand seamer in full flow at Wellington um, during what became known as England's Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll Tour. Uh, this was New Zealand's first series win over England. So a, a significant moment. Um, uh, and it was a famous tour. I mean, Elton John was touring New Zealand at the time and, and is a big cricket fan. So he was kind of in and out of the England dressing room. The England players were going to see his concerts. Both of them and Alan Lamb were allegedly smoking weed in the dressing room, which was um, they deny strongly. Um, so the series became kind of important for reasons other than cricket again. Um, and the, the game that this photo is taken from actually was a, was a draw, as was the third match of the series. But in between that, New Zealand won by an innings at Christchurch, uh, inspired by Hadley scoring 99 and, and taking eight wickets. Um, so it was very much Hadley was the architect of, of this series win. And, there's a couple of reasons I picked it. I haven't mentioned yet. My, my dad's a New Zealander, so I've got, got strong Kiwi roots and um, always supported New Zealanders as well as England. Uh, well, it gets a bit tricky when they play each other. Yeah, what happened uh, in the final then? I thought you might ask that. I have to say, I didn't find that as tricky as, as it might sound. I was very much rooting for England. Um, I think part of that is because I work in... Uh, the English cricket media and I know what a World Cup win meant for England and, and the impact it would have and the fact that my friends would be following cricket and the fact that we would sell some more magazines all this kind of stuff comes into it so I was definitely <laughs> I felt very sorry for New Zealand uh, it was a horrible way to lose but I, I, I wasn't um, my allegiances didn't feel too divided for that particular game um, but I have always had a very a soft spot for, um, for New Zealand I mean my, my dad talks passionately about New Zealand cricket because he he saw it at its absolute worst I mean it was he always says that the, the All Blacks always take care of themselves because they've always been such a strong dominant side but it was very different for the New Zealand cricket team and they didn't win a test for 44 matches across 26 years after yeah. becoming a test side and my dad who was aged nine at the time remembers New Zealand being bowled out for 26 by England in 1955 which is still the lowest test total in in history so these these scars run deep uh wins were scarce and precious but that began to change in the 80s largely because of Hadley and, and Martin Crow and New Zealand became a a really strong um side and, and Hadley in particular was a real point of pride because New Zealand just didn't have world dominating cricketers or even a side that won matches but Hadley became the leading test wicket taker in history for a time and this was suddenly an iconic cricketer who New Zealand could claim as their own. And, and Crow probably falls into that category as well. And this photo just really captures Hadley as a, a bowler and his, particularly his kind of smoothness and efficiency. I mean, there were quicker bowlers around, but probably none more accurate. And a, a lot of the best batsmen you speak to, you say Hadley, Hadley gave them absolute nightmares. And the thing with Hadley was everything was so perfectly planned and immaculately executed. And there's a nice story in, in 1984 when he was playing for Nottinghamshire over here in, in County Cricket. Um, he'd written down on, on a piece of paper and planned out in minute detail how he was going to reach the landmark of 100 wickets and 1,000 first-class runs in a county season, which is a, a significant landmark over here. And, and it doesn't get done anymore because there's just not enough cricket played. Last one and was Franklin Stephenson, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Good knowledge. Um, and prior to Hadley, I think it had been 15 or 16 years since anyone had done it, but he had written this out on a piece of paper, taped it in inside his cricket bag and worked out exactly where he was going to need to take his wickets and where he was going to score his runs. 
And he basically followed it almost to the letter and achieved that milestone with a game to spare, which I thought kind of summed up Hadley's uh, his, his preparation and his kind of attention to detail. Um, and another reason I picked out this photo was because it was taken by Patrick Eager, who is the absolute doyen of cricket photography. I couldn't pick five photos without having an Eager in there. Um, so, for, yeah, for those two reasons, that's why this was my number number five pick. Beautiful photograph and, well, what to say about the great all-rounder. And you're so correct in saying that it is incredible how Martin Crowe and Richard Hadley actually raised the New Zealand cricket. Till 70s, New Zealand were pushovers and in 80s, they become such an incredibly strong side. So it was brilliant. And for all our viewers here, here is a bit of an anecdote from this test series, which of course England went on to lose 1-0 because they lost the second test by an innings. So after the first test, an injury to Graham Dilley resulted in a call-up for Sussex bowler Tony Pigott, who was playing for Wellington in that winter. Now, Pigott had been due to get married on the fourth day of the second test, like the one which was to become his debut, and he cancelled his wedding because of that. What resulted was that England were shot out for less than 100 on both their innings, and that meant that the match even did not make it as far as Pigot's original wedding date. So that's that's quite an interesting uh, anecdote, which I often, you know, when it comes to this tour, which is always remembered for the wrong reasons, I always find this interesting. I think he got absolutely taken to pieces by Hadley as well, um, from memory, <laughs> for looking at that scorecard. Moving on to you know, the section that we call the one that got away, where we ask our guests to talk about a moment in the game's history which should have been captured or could have been captured but is not captured right now. You know, there are no existing photographs of that memory or that moment. So if I ask you to pick one, which one would you pick? Which moment would you tell our viewers about? I'm going back to another England tour of India, uh, 2012. Uh, now, there must be photos out there of, of this innings that I'm going to talk about, taken by BCCI photographers. But for this series, local and international photography agencies were banned. So there is nothing on Getty, nothing on Press Association. So whenever we refer back to this match or this innings in the magazine or on wisdom.com, we, we can't use any photos to accompany it, uh, which is a real shame given some of the outrageous shots played in it. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I would go back in time and, and tell the BCCI to sort the racks out and let the world's best photographers into the ground to capture this extraordinary knot, which is, of course, Kevin Peterson's 186 at Mumbai in 2012. Um, one of the greatest test innings ever played by an England batsman. I rank it as the best that I've ever seen, given the conditions, the context of the match, uh, the fact he'd been recently reintegrated into the side after his fallout with uh, Andrew Strauss, and the fact that it set up a historic series win for England. I think India, I think I'm right in saying India have only lost one test at home since that series. Uh, ridiculous record. Um, so that is, that's for me, at least for me, the one that got away, even though there might be some photos out there which other people can access. Behind the paywall, maybe. But yeah, I, I mean, there is nothing that I disagree uh, on that as much as on the part of, you know, how that the, there should be photographers allowed in, inside the stadium to click, click these uh, pictures of these innings. To the point that this is easily the best knock played by Kevin Peterson. He did get a number of double centuries, but... This was something else. As in, as an Indian, it hurt a lot to see him bat that way. But what amazed me was how he tackled spin on that turning track against the likes of Harbhajan Singh, Pragyan Ojha, and you know it was. It is easily one of the best knocks. Not one of the best knocks, in my opinion. It is the best knock played in India by an overseas cricketer, hands down. Is that right? I mean, yeah, you'd be able to obviously judge that much better than me. But certainly, for yeah, if I look at the other side of an England overseas innings, it's it's got to be up there. I mean, the context as well. I mean, Peterson had was really struggling against spin at that time, particularly against left arm spin on the previous tour. Jim, that was when they kept giving Yuvraj Singh early overs with his with his pies, as <laughs> Peterson called them. And and India had a lot of success. And I, it, Peterson came out with this innings, and, and he's spoken to us about about it where. He said he just had to come and have a go. There was no point in, in prodding around because he was just going to get out. So he decided to, to take the attacks of the bowlers and, and in particular Oja, who played some just outstanding shots off. 
it just defines Peterson the man that he is and the Peterson the batsman that we remember he was flamboyant he was fearless and he really did not care much about the rest of the things when he got his groove so this is one knock where you see you know if if i were to point to one peterson knock and say you know if you watch this knock you would understand what kevin peterson is i would point to this knock i think you're right i i think that's fair i think this was around this time was really the the peterson at his best as a batsman i mean we obviously english fans hold the knock at the oval in 2005 in a, it has a very special place in our hearts because it, it ended all those years of misery against australia and it was just a, a crazy crazy knock but it was uncontrolled it was wild it was he says himself Beck Brittley was just bowling faster and faster and he was just whacking it further and further but there was there wasn't really a kind of thought process to it in the same way that this innings he had all that raw talent and all the stroke play but he also had real now as a test batsman and could kind of control a game uh, in a way that English batsmen typically haven't. I mean, Alistair Cook on that series, in that series, was absolutely phenomenal. Um, but it almost gets forgotten because of Peterson. But those two together, they were the perfect combination that Cook would just battle, battle all day and Peterson would take the attack to India's bowlers. And actually, Cook was scoring quite fluently in the end because Peterson had just opened up the game in that way. Well, who could have told that there was so much going on between the two who were pretty much the pillars of that English batting lineup at that point. But whatever that is, they won the series 2-1 and it is one of the better wins by an overseas team here. I mean, uh, back in 2004 when Australia won against India, you know, the touring Australian side, I would say that that series could have gone here and there because there was a second test which, uh, you know, uh, the last day of that test got rained out. And I feel that India had a good chance of chasing down the target of just 220. But this is one incredible win. After the first test, the way England bounced back and gave India almost nothing, that was incredible. That uh, brings us to the end of a brilliant chat with a really fun guest, I would say. And some really f- lovely pictures have been brought to our notice. And as I keep saying, the stories add so much to the pictures. The story of how you developed an aversion to... Uh, Mike Gatting for what he did to Atherton when you were just, what, eight year old? So, yeah, I, I love these stories. We all see these pictures, right? We all look look at them through our own eyes. But when we tell our stories of, of the pictures, it adds a different layer altogether. So that's something that I really enjoy on this podcast, talking to people and talking to people about photographs. And you enthralled us with a lovely list of photographs. Thank you so much, Joe. Oh, thanks, Sam. It's been a pleasure to be on.